According to the University of Arkansas system, tenured professors can be fired for not being, wait for it, nice enough to students. What this really means in liberal speak is that you can sleep with students, skip your own classes, and generally suck as a teacher as long as you don't offer an opinion that challenges progressive orthodoxy. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Everyone and welcome to the Dr. Duke Show, the only program nationwide that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. We are back on the college campus this week, back to school, and today we're taking a look at a study that finds young Americans trust their college professors more than the military, police, and religious leaders. Wonder who did that to them. Plus, an artificial intelligence system designed by a prestigious college to identify hate speech finds, drum roll, that minorities are the worst offenders when it comes to hate speech. Pretty sure there'll be no bias response teams addressing that. But we start with a story out of Arkansas, where new campus rules say professors can lose tenure if they aren't nice enough. Yes, you heard that correctly. If you aren't nice enough, you could lose tenure, at least if you are employed, through any one of the 21 University Arkansas campus system schools. So there was a class action lawsuit that was actually brought forth this summer by three currently tenured professors, and it was based on this revised policy that the University of Arkansas system put out. And it's talking about tenure, faculty promotion, and annual reviews. So the professors are Philip Pallade, who is a pharmacology, toxicology, so science. We have Gregory Bors, who's an English professor. D decidedly not science. Mm. Okay. And then J. Thomas Sullivan, who's a law professor. So you have three very diverse gentlemen. And they claim that this revised policy, it not only violates their contractual and due process rights, but it will chill the speech and infringe the First Amendment rights of faculty as a whole. And it will. This is really what is another way of going for the collegiality clause. I've had this thrown in my face many times over my unillustrious 25 years as a professor. The idea that if you don't get along with your colleagues, it's your fault. And and the fact that all your colleagues are liberal progressives and you're not means by definition you are not collegial. I was at a little school in uh, Pennsylvania right outside of Philadelphia called Ursinus College. And it was a small department, about 1,000 kids on campus, and there were about seven or eight professors. And they all thought one way and I thought the other way. And that was fine until kids started taking my classes and started shying away from some of the others. Oh, then did the collegiality clause come right out. That's when the feelings were hurt. That's when the feelings are hurt and Dr. Pesta was fired, fired, fired in the middle of a semester for disagreeing with his tenured colleagues. That's exactly what happened. And so here we are 20 years later and it comes around again. And that's the dangerous aspect of this, Katie, is, is that the prevailing ethos is all progressive. It's all one way. Again, which means if you are not and you, you live and act and teach that way, by definition, you are noncompliant. See, now I was going to end this whole story talking about seeing if you had any personal experiences, but I know oh, you, you have sure many did. we could talk about. I'll never forget so. it. I had uh, uh, one of the reasons they hired me at this small school when they hired me, there was, I guess, about seven or eight professors. I was told again and again and again at the hiring, uh, at the meeting to be hired, well, you know, it's just such a shame here, Dr. Pesta. Our kids, they're so progressive. They don't want to take dead white males. They don't want to take older literature. Uh, we need somebody to reinvigorate that. We need somebody to come in <laughs> and get the kids interested. And again, in a school with about a thousand, major, a thousand students, there were only 30, 40 majors, right? Which means there weren't that many classes that could fill. Well, within a couple of months, my classes were very different, and I did it. I reinvigorated the study of Shakespeare, and suddenly African American lit didn't make, and suddenly mm. other pro progressive courses. See, the problem, they were offering all the same course, identity studies politics, okay. right? African American, Native American. And so suddenly these kids were getting woke to Shakespeare <laughs> and woke. Whoa. We actually did a course on the Fairy Queen. Try reading that sometime. Spencer's Fairy Queen, 16th century, the longest poem in the English language. I had kids fall in love with that. Didn't go over very well with my colleagues, especially when their classes started not to make. I actually had a, uh, one professor, not surprisingly a creative writer, <laughs> come up to me and say, Dr. Pesta, I understand that you're teaching both sides of issues in your classroom. I thought it was a compliment. I actually thought he was complimenting me. He said, oh, yeah. He, he, don't you understand, he said, that our kids are so racist and sexist that you must only teach them the progressive worldview. <sighs> it, didn't go, it didn't get better from there. I was going to say it, uh, it could only get worse didn't from there. didn't get better from and there. And it did. Well, those kids were probably trusting you, but then we find out that all young Americans are trusting of their professors these days more than, according to a new uh, poll, more than even the military 
the police or any religious leaders. So the young Americans are showing less trust in key institutions, military, police officers, religious leaders, than college professors. And this is coming out of Pew Research. Um, the broad study they did was called Trust and Distrust in America. So you can look it up. It was actually conducted in late 2018. And they found out of the more than 10,000 adults that they surveyed uh, in the various age groups, those in the 18 to 29 year old bracket, 74% of them trust college professors, but 69% trust military, 67% trust police, and only 50% trust religious leaders. I'm surprised it's that high. This is one of those duh stories, right? For how long now, 20, 30 years, have, have university professors been adamantly going after cops, going after the military, and going after, what's the third one? The religious leaders. Oh, God, leaders. religious people. No wonder they're oh God, priests, priests and men. No wonder. The 50, they, they, they manage, the professors yeah. are being very ineffective if only 50%, <laughs> if as many they as 50% actually trust uh, the religious leaders. So this doesn't surprise me. This is a completely uh, uh, routine story. Again, I'm surprised the numbers aren't higher. I mean, it's, I'm surprised that that many still do like the military. When you think about the non-slot uh, offensive against these kinds of, of, of people, the, the most despicable aspect of the the story and the one that we should remember is how many more of these kids trust their professors than anybody else. Because professors are not trustworthy. We're just not. But we have PhDs and we they get us for four years, the four the four most potentially influential years of their lives, possibly. That time between high school and adulthood. I mean maybe mid mid adolescence, but this is a very important period. And all they get is the same progressive worldview. So uh, mom and dad don't mom and dad are just engineers and computer scientists who pay for your kids' college. But professors have PhDs. He went to graduate school for 13 years to study underwater basket weaving. And so consequently, these guys know what's going on. That's a hugely high number when you think about the lack of life experience for most professors. What do we have in common here? The military is out fighting wars, right? The police are dealing with human rabble every day. And the religious have to deal with the worst aspects of culture and society. What do professors do? They sit in their faculty loungers and squawk, squawk, squawk. Yeah, well, and it does not help at all that a lot of the parents of these young 18 to 29-year-olds are saying, just listen to your teacher. Just they, They've been getting that K-12 because the parents don't want to be parents and take control and actually, mm, I don't know, engage with their child and teach them various things so that they can look up to other viewpoints they say just listen to your teacher and then they by the time they get to the university just listen to the professor because they have that that bully pulpit up there in the front which we talked about in uh, other episodes this is why we have it now if you want to compare let's just do a quick comparison uh as you get older and this is just in general i mean if you look at any research going back as you get older your trust in these other institutions will grow comes back a little it bit. comes well and we're it's we called, can only hope, I it's guess. It's called real life. Oh, that's experience. Real life interpeat. You right. realize when, when your house is being burglarized, your sociology professor is hiding under the sheets with his kitten, that's true. and you are the one who's going to have to call the cops, right? Uh, the thing that gets me is this. Quote, young Americans also demonstrated less trust in their fellow citizens regarding American civility. Really? This is the group of young college-age kids who, who, who are BDSM, who join Antifa, Black Lives Matter. These are the young college kids, like at Oberlin College, who are screepy, screeching at their professors what they will and won't do, demanding that this picture be taken down or this curriculum be re, re, reinvented. These are the kids screaming about civility? Surprise, surprise. I mean, that's where we're at now, and we're going to say that every, you know, every generation blames the one before. But it's interesting to see as we continue on here now in 2019 into 2020, which uh, will be an interesting year, if these numbers continue to just go down or if they're just going to stay steady at this. Well, the professors are the generation before. Exactly. And they don't get blamed, right? They because should Because they be. are the straw, straw that, stirs, that stirs this rancid drink, <sighs> right? And so on the one hand, these professors are teaching kids that all these things are bad, religious, police, military, that only people who can be trusted are professors. And yet ironically, and I've made this point many times, the only really thing, the only way you can rebel on a college campus, the only possible way you can be an actual rebel on a college campus is to become a Christian who loves the military, Right, and who wants to be a cop when you graduate? I mean, yeah. the, the, this is—it's impossible to rebel. It is the 
It is the most alarming form of mindless conformity. These kids step on college campuses, and within six months, they all have the same little tattoo. The girls get the same little tattoo on their ankle, Mm -hmm. right? The boys have all the same man buns. Yep. It it is the most absolutely conformist environment. You immediately fall lockstep in line with your over 30 professors, right? What happened when rebellion used to be never trust trust anybody over the age of 30? Now it's you've got a PhD after your name. And by the way, if you have a PhD after your name, that means you are the most conformed. You are the one who has spent the most time not having to make a real living. You have spent the most time in your life in school. You have spent the most time behind the ivy-covered walls of academia. You are least of all rebellious. You are com- with your, you're the only organization that has tenure. After six bloody damn years, you can get, not get fired for doing anything except not smiling at University of Arkansas at your kids. You, you get tenure. How, what, what is there that's actually rebellious about this? My God, uh, po- grade B pop stars like t- Taylor Swift are more radically rebellious behind her million dollar mansion than the typical tenured professor is. Yet you little kids, you college kids, they fall right in line behind this garbage. They're all lost boys. They're lost all boys. little Peter Pans. How, how gender- lost boys. Other than your, and girls. your under, other than your use of the gender, I know. the gendered, uh, we would go a lot. lost persons. Lost persons. It's the generation of lost persons. Oh yes. All right. Well, we're gonna move on to some uh, AI, artificial intelligence, because colleges now have taken it upon themselves to use such AI to identify hate speech and mm. I guess I just did I engage in some hate speech before by gender. You used gendering? the word boy. You I sure did. did. Boy. All right, well it turns out when we use all this AI technology and uh, identify all this hate speech Oops, the minorities are, are actually the worst offenders of does said this, hate speech. Does this surprise anybody with who listens to popular music? Does this surprise no. anybody who watches uh, HBO? Does this surprise anybody with half a brain in their head? That when you boil down to it, who's the one who has the most sharply offensive view of race? It's minorities. I mean, do you ever see black comedians? You ever watch Bean? black yes. comedians? Okay. Comedians. I mean, I mean, and I love Dave Chappelle, but boy, does he rip into people, oh. white people included. Oh, yeah. who, who throws around, who, who is the most predictably anti-gay demographic in America today? That would be African Americans. And, and, and God bless them, they're not shy about saying it. They get mad when you and I say it. Oh, of course. But they're perfectly fine to exercise their First Amendment rights and talk smack about everybody. Uh, but are you surprised by this? Come on. You, you can't possibly be so. And it took artificial intelligence to determine, in other words, this is not human bias, that the, org, the group that spends most of its time engaging in these kind of slurs are minorities. Well, okay, yes. And Google, if you paid any attention, has been using AI for, yep. for years and years. But all the researchers at these universities, the ones who have the PhDs, have to research something. So we have researchers at Cornell uh, who decided to look into this whole hate speech identification using AI, and they found that their system, which they were looking at data from tweets, it flagged what they deemed to be hate speech comments at substantially higher rates by those minorities than by white people. And the authors actually claim they uh, train their classifiers because there has to be still some human engagement here to identify what it, they mean by hate speech. Um, on their data sets, they compare the predictions of the classifiers on tweets that were written in African-American English. As you know, ver- the, AA, uh, AAVE, a- African-American Vernacular English. The group that gave us no yes. and choke a hoe that one. That group is the one that has surprisingly the most sexist slurs, right? Didn't see it coming. Study also revealed that black aligned tweets are sexist at almost twice the rate of white, white aligned tweets. But don't let that fool you. <laughs> Everything is the problem of the cisgendered white men. It is. Black men go around putting caps in cops and choking hoes because of white privilege and white supremacy. Don't ever let anybody tell you differently. And when Af- it's like the N-word, right? When African Americans drop the R off it and put an A. Dave right? Chappelle. Right, exactly. You drop the R off the N word and you put an A. Suddenly, it is it, it's a, a oh, word it's of bonding. Oh, yeah. It's woke. It's progressive. But you and I both know the way that word's bandied about in African American culture. But again, don't let this get in the way of your completely constructed university myth that it's cisgendered white men who are out there making all the slurs and doing all the hate speech. Well, yes, and from the studies abstract, they even talk about how the results show evidence of systematic racial bias in all data sets as classifiers trained on them tend to predict that tweets written in African-American English are abusive at substantially higher rates. Can, but can I repeat that? <laughs> abusive yes. at substantially higher levels. Again, if this was 
14-year-old white boys on their Palm Pilots. Do we even still have Palm Pilots? 14-year-old no, buys on the boys don't. on their Palm Pilots. This would be a nationwide crisis that would make the gun problem we have now seem trivial. Yeah, but they go on to say it, it's, of course, that system, uh, systematic racial bias in that. And somehow they, of course, skew it to make it sound all nice because we can't even no. possibly just use data. The idea that these it. Cornell University pasty white professors would go on uh, a crusade to stop African Americans from cussing and using abusive language, I would laugh hysterically to see him try it. They know they can't. So what's going to be the fallback on this, right? Uh, systemic, right? C- white people created the system. So when blacks use it worse than others, it's actually white people's fault. Welcome to modern academia. Well, that's all she wrote, at least for today. As always, please share this episode and subscribe to the free audio podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and everywhere else. Just visit drdukeshow.com and click on any of the platforms on the top of the screen so you can subscribe for free. And that does it for us today. We'll be back again tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. And always remember, stay educated, my friends. <laughs>